I'm Jacqueline Sundberg. Welcome to today's event, Building McGill with Professor David Kovo. Um, I am joining you from my home, which is not far from McGill's downtown campus. And as we are in particular talking about McGill campus today and the buildings on it, um, I'm going to take a moment and acknowledge the land on which McGill stands. So McGill University is located on land that has long served as a place for meeting and exchange amongst nations and indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe nations. Roar honors, recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which McGill stands today. So we're gonna hear about some of the buildings and the stories that they contain from Professor Kovo, but it's important to remember that long before there were buildings, there were people meeting and using and stewarding this land. So on that note, I have a couple final comments and I'm gonna pass it over to Jennifer Garland, the head of Rare Books and Special Collections for some collection comments about the architecture material you're going to be hearing today, hearing about later today, sorry. So one final comment from me, um, I just wanna say a few thank yous because there's some work that goes into making these events possible. And um, some of the thank yous are for the people who are behind the scenes who helped with setup. So my colleague Greg stepped in today and um, he definitely uh, helped with setting up the, sorting out the hybrid AV difficulties, um, which definitely, huh, definitely occur, of course. Um, so thank you to Greg, to our staff who make these events possible by setting up our rooms. And thank you too, to the donors who support our events. Um, they make it possible for us to offer events free of charge on a regular basis. So thank you for everyone who joins us with generosity and curiosity and financial support. We do look forward to new spaces for future events with our building redesign project Fiat Lux. Illumination is the spirit of that project, which will totally transform our building um, and this footprint on campus. So we do look forward to that. It's, it's an exciting moment for our library. So on that note, I'm going to stop my screen share and I'll introduce Jennifer Garland here to take over. Excellent. Okay, it's my pleasure to share more information about um, the study of architecture through library resources uh, with you today. So we'll move from uh, a beautiful autumn scene at McGill into the stacks. So first up is our Blackadder Lauderman Library of Architecture and Art. This is home to a wonderful collection of monographs and journals to support the teaching and research needs of our McGill community and beyond. Supports the history of Byzantine and medieval art, iconography, Renaissance art, European architecture and Canadian art and architecture. McGill's rare collections uh, are found here on the fourth floor of McLennan. Among our rare Blackadder materials include volumes of Palladio, Surleo, and Ledoux, among many others, as well as 18th century engraver Paranesi. Few of those works shown here on screen, and I, I can't not think of Paranesi without thinking of Professor David Covo because we have a, an annual standing visit by his undergraduate student class to visit the works here on site in the library. Here's a quick time-lapse video from a couple of years ago, students exploring the material here in our Colgate room. These collections are heavily used by our McGill community and we love that. We love having a teaching collection that our students are able to access and interact with. Now, switching a little bit from collections uh, to collections that support the study of McGill architecture, our uh, Roar units all support the study of McGill campus history. Everything from uh, architecture and its buildings to the activities that took place in those buildings and are happening today. For my part, I'm responsible for the John Bland Canadian Architecture Collection. So here's a view by Percy Nobbs in the 1920s, bird's eye view that's not unlike what we're seeing outside of our windows today. The John Bland Collection documents the work of past and present architects who were trained at the McGill School of Architecture. 
uh, including its faculty, its students, and its past directors. The collection includes approximately 100 fonds. Uh, in addition to Percy Nobbs, there's Edward and William Maxwell, um, whose work beginning from the late 19th century into the early 20th century really documents the development of the McGill campus uh, and the city and beyond. The collection also houses more contemporary designs. I'm thinking of the work of outstanding graduates such as Moshe Safdie and Arthur Erickson. On the screen here, you have a, a view of McGill architecture that never was. So the unbuilt McGill is well represented in the collection. As well, presentation watercolors. This is the Royal Victoria College on Sherbrooke Street. Architectural drawings, including an elevation seen here. Many, many photographs, including construction of our campus buildings, uh, documentation of the built projects on our campus, interior spaces, <clears throat> as well as furniture. Many of these furniture pieces uh, are now part of the library collection. Stained glass windows, of course, across the campus. Architectural details such as those seen here. And I'll close on a view of the Canadian architecture stacks. So we're seeing lots of our architectural drawings laying flat on shelves and, uh, and many, many files in boxes. This is just a small taste of what we have here in the Roar collections. And I include my colleagues in the visual arts collection, the McGill University archives and the Osler Library of the History of Medicine when I talk about McGill architecture to be discovered in our Roar collections. So it's, it's my pleasure now to turn it over to Chris Lyons who will introduce today's speaker. Chris Lyons is Associate Dean of the ROAR units. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much. I just wanna to check to see Jennifer. Can you hear me okay? Cause I've unmuted the mic. The sound is good on Zoom. Excellent, good. Well, um, before we uh, invite uh, Professor Kovo up to speak, I just wanted to say one thing and point something out to you that I think is one of the things that I think within this field makes me so incredibly happy, particularly here at McGill, because you're here to hear a, a talk by someone who's an expert on the field of architecture and innovative and enthusiastic and interesting. So we have the expertise and then we also have the collections. So we have this, the, the raw material to do a lot of great things and not just in the area of studying architecture or studying Shakespearean scholarship, but also to create art, to create poetry, um, to inspire in ways we can't even anticipate. And I say that because I like everyone to know that this is an open collection. We're available to everyone. So be you in the room now at home or watching us from the other side of the world, you're always welcome. But there's a third element to this. And I think this is equally important. And that's the, um, Charity, charity, goodwill, good wishes, and of people who support the library. I'm sure there are more, but there are two people in the room I'd like to acknowledge right now. That's uh, Mr. David Lank and Mr. Peter McNally, Professor Peter McNally, who have all, both been Jennifer, generous in building wonderful collections in natural history and the history of printing. And I thank you because we couldn't do what we're doing if you didn't do what you do and would support us. We're coming into a big, building project called Fiat Lux, and we're very excited about that. And you saw pictures of our stacks, and we don't usually show people pictures of our stacks, but our stacks and our reading room and our presentation room and our books art lab in the next few years are going to be just spectacular. We are going to be giving a gift not only to McGill, not only to scholars, but to Montreal, Quebec, and the world. And again, that's thanks to a lot of hard work by a lot of people, and one in particular, and Room, the wife of uh, David Lank, has been instrumental in leading that as former president or chair of the Friends of the Library. So what you're seeing today is, is really something that's built on this foundation of wonderful, wonderful efforts. Uh, the individual scholarship of uh, Professor Kovo, but also the works of other people in the room. And 
We tend to be unsung heroes, so it's nice to be able to sing about them every now and again. And on that note, let me introduce to you our speaker, David Covo, for those of you who don't know him, and I find that hard to believe, but let's just assume there are those of you who don't know him. He's associate professor and director and past director of the Peter Guangfa School of Architecture. He teaches design architecture, drawing and plein air sketching. And uh, I know one of the places they do that in is St. John, New Brunswick. So he sees the beauty in a city that not everyone necessarily sees the beauty, but it's a, an appreciation we share. He also participates in two courses at the School of Physical and Occupational Therapy. His current research addresses drawing and representation, universal design of the architect and the architecture of Arthur Erickson. He's been active in teaching in our research in Mexico, China, Romania, South Korea, and Singapore. One hopes in the winter, one goes and does that kind of work. He's a member of the Order of Architects of Quebec and a fellow of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada. And he's also a speaker in high demand as you will no doubt understand in a moment. I'd like to invite you up, David. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Jacqueline, uh, for that uh, wonderful um, introduction to the collection and to, I, didn't, I don't think I recognize myself very e easily there, but I, but I do appreciate what you, what you said. I would also like to uh, add my own welcome to the small group of people assembled here in the Colgate Room, which really is a delightful place to have a, a presentation like, like this one. Just give me a minute. I'm going to uh, go ahead and uh, start my presentation. Uh, great. I'm going to I'm going to start then. Um, I'm not sure where to begin. Uh, what what I'm going to try to uh, show you today is a fragment, really, of a presentation that I've made many times over the years. I think the first time. I put this kind of presentation together was at the request of Peter McNally and the James McGill Society, who were interested, and this is probably about 20 years ago, uh, they were particularly interested at a point in McGill's history when we were looking at a fairly dramatic transformation of the campus. Uh, the James McGill Society thought there might be an opportunity to get a glimpse of what was five years down the road or six years down the road. And, and the presentation that I put together for Peter and uh, our colleagues in the James McGill Society at that time, I think has led to a kind of uh, dynamic database of historical images that uh, now include a lot of archival material from the John Bland Architecture Collection uh, and other archives, um, as well as um, material that uh, we've been putting together in the School of Architecture based on our own research into the campus itself, into the idea of campus design, and into the work of specific architects uh, whose, whose work relates in some way to, um, to the idea of building a university. I'm, I'm starting, uh, my question was to, to Chris and Jennifer, was what to do? Uh, should I do the usual 250 slide presentation that, that goes for, runs for two hours and, and Chris said, no, we're looking for something shorter. So what I've tried to do is boil it down. I'll say something about that in a few minutes. What I'd like to do now is, is start. But first I've got to get rid of the screen. Okay. Uh, what we're looking at here is a series of stamps put out by Canada Post in 2007. Canada Post decided to mark the centennial of the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada with a series of stamps celebrating Canadian architecture and in particular, Canadian architects. Originally, the intention was to look at eight buildings and eight architects, and, and they worked over a period of months, possibly years, uh, with the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada, the RAIC, and eventually narrowed it down. Uh, so the architects finally chosen are the ones you see here, Arthur Erickson, uh, working down from the top, Douglas Cardinal, Raymond Moriyama, and Moshe Slafter. What do these architects have in common? Well, first of all, they've all got degrees from McGill. Uh, all of them have honorary doctorates and two of them, Arthur Erickson and Raymond Moriyama, uh, well, three of them, uh, Erickson, Moriyama and Safdie have uh, actually studied here. 
Uh, Erickson and Safdie completed their professional degrees here in 1950 and 1961. And Raymond Moriyama did a Master of Architecture. Ours was one of the first Master of Architecture programs in Canada. And Ray did a Master's at McGill in 1956. And you can see the dates uh, when uh, each of the four of them were honored by McGill with an honorary doctorate. Um, and, uh, it's very interesting to me that one of the four buildings selected by in that conversation between Canada Post and the REIC uh, was, um, was a university building. Uh, the particular opportunities and, and challenges associated with campus planning and the design of university buildings are well known, and I think it's fair to say well understood by all architects. McGill grad Arthur Erickson, whose designs of Lethbridge University, shown here, and Simon Fraser in Burnaby, BC, are, are iconic, expressed it very well when he wrote in 1968, you see it on the screen, a campus is uh, like an acropolis, an urban compression. And this is the expression, or this is the phrase I like. He said, he said it's a fragment of utopia. The idea that a campus can be seen that way, I think is, is magical. And it's, it's an expression that I use often uh, in my own teaching. Uh, Erickson said that this fragment of utopia suggests a pattern for the ideal city, in which he adds, everything depends on the space between, the idea of the common ground. And Erickson's not alone uh, in, in seeing this kind of opportunity, this kind of potential in, in engaging clients like the university and sites like university campuses. Um, architect and educator William Mitchell, co-founder of the Media Lab at MIT, in his uh, very excellent book, Building MIT, is equally eloquent. Uh, he says, when colleges and universities build, they don't just add to their inventories of floor space. They reveal, and the italics are mine, sometimes unwittingly, their prevailing values, aspirations, and preoccupations. Campuses, he goes on, are evolving, continually contested representations of the communities they house. I, I think that that paragraph should be the top of, at the top of every brief the university gives to the architects and landscape architects and other designers with whom we work. Um, uh, American architect Lewis Kahn uh, also, also jumps into the conversation when he says, and he puts it, uh, I think, a, a little differently. He says, every time a student walks past a really, and I love this word, urgent, expressive piece of architecture that belongs to his or her college, it helps to reassure him or her that he does have that mind, does have that soul. The notion, the notion that it's a kind of confirmation or, or a reaffirmation, a celebration of knowledge, confidence, and trust. It's very exciting. And finally, even, even Le Corbusier, the Swiss, the celebrated Paris-based Swiss architect, uh, and seen here uh, on the old Swiss 10 franc note, uh, had an opinion when he says the American university and he wrote this following a visit to the US, I think in the 1930s or 40s, he said, the American university he said, is a world in itself, a temporary paradise. And, and I, I keep reminding my students about that. In other words, uh, architects like working with colleges and universities. Let's talk about McGill. Most of you know the history. In 1813, James McGill died and bequeathed 10,000 pounds and a 46 acre estate to create an institution for the advancement of learning. The university was established in 1821 and opened the doors of its first new building, now the Central Pavilion of the Arts Building, in 1843. And today, 201 years after its founding, the university's downtown precinct includes more than 120 buildings, uh, uh, almost all of which are concentrated on the 80 uh, plus or minus acres of the greater campus as it rises from Sherbrooke Street to the flank of Mount Royal, stretching from Avenue du Parc in the east to De La Montagne in the west. The physical heritage, I wanted to add, under the university's stewardship uh, also includes the natural environment. The campus itself is one of the most important green spaces in the city's downtown core, used by the public and the campus community year round as an urban park and social space for both recreation and contemplation. The preservation of this green space as a mediating element between the natural environment of the mountain uh, and the urban environment of the city is an essential component of the university's service to the Montreal community. 
The central location of the campus and its privileged position between the city core and Mount Royal make the combination of McGill's landscape and its mix of historic and modern architecture, I think, unique in Canada, if not North America. I have only 30 minutes or so. I've, now I've only got about 25 left. <laughs> Chris has got the stopwatch running and there's so many stories to share. Um, what I thought might be interesting for this presentation would be to focus on three themes, water, fire, and steam. Uh, I, I've been racking my brain for the last month or so, trying to find a way to eliminate the, the dozens of stories I could share with you if we had more, more time and more resources. So I thought water, fire, and steam uh, might provide a convenient uh, rubric, if you like, a convenient filter for three and maybe a little bit more uh, main stories about the evolution of the campus. I'll start with uh, water and the role it played in the creation of the campus as a middle ground between the mountain and the city core, and in the creation of McGill College Avenue as a wondrous urban room with the campus in Mount Royal at one end and the Place Ville Marie Plaza at the other. So two different ideas there. Fire will be next and how fire uh, flames shaped a significant portion of the main campus. And finally, we're gonna look at steam and the unlikely role it played in the formulation of a new green space and, and, and more a new approach to campus landscape as a place of teaching and learning and social encounter. So, so let's begin. What are we looking at on the screen? This is a drawing of the building where I work on the main campus of McGill. Uh, one, of the, one of my uh, unofficial research areas involves children's drawings. I, I collect them uh, and I talk about them a lot uh, to my own students and my own teaching and also when I lecture uh, elsewhere. Uh, I, I've always liked uh, the um, words of the cartoonist Saul Steinberg, whom many of you may know, who was actually educated as an architect in Romania, but built a very successful career as an artist and um, principal cartoonist for the New Yorker magazine. When, when he said at one time, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't have it in front of me, he said that uh, he's always um, been able to um, preserve, one of the secrets of his success has been his ability to, to preserve his ability to draw like a child. And when I, talk to, when I talk to my students in first year about drawing, I talk a lot about the freedom with which children will actually draw uh, make mistakes and, and bend the rules that we associate with all of the drawing strategies uh, with which we work. Um, so this drawing was done by the young son of one of my colleagues. Uh, he, I think he was three or four at the time. Most of us who know, who know the campus were able to read the drawing when it was shown to us, I think in a faculty meeting some, some years ago. But we wondered about, the, about the, uh, some parts of it. You know, we recognize uh, in general, the McDonald Harrington building there, which is where we've been since 1987. But we weren't sure what that was, that little shape down at the bottom. And uh, some people tried to guess, is it a construction hut, is it a vehicle? Uh, and in fact, uh, we finally asked uh, Charlie uh, what the object in the green circle was. And he, and he said, well, it's that big building beside you. In other words, he said, it's the Faculty of Engineering. <laughs> uh, now, kids say the darndest things. And, and they see things that adults don't. So how, how remarkable that Charlie sees the relationship between, between architecture and engineering in that way and not in the, and, and not in the way that, that we're used to when we look at the photographs. Um, the School of Architecture is one of eight units in the faculty with whom we in, enjoy a very, very constructive and uh, evolving uh, and more and more productive relationship. Um, but you wouldn't know it from Charlie's drawings. What about that object um, in the red circle? Any thoughts about that? Bench. What's that? A bench. A bench. I had a, no, no, it's not a bench. Yeah. A fence? What is it? A gate? Which gate? Which, which gate? Well, in fact, it is the Rodder Gates. It is the Rodder Gates. And, and that surprised us. So, but Charlie's breaking the rule. I'll go back just for a second. You know, you, you can't see the, the Roddick gates aren't, aren't lying like an archeological ruin on the lawn in front of the McDonald Harrington building, but he needs to tell us that the experience of going through the gates was important to him when he, when he visits his dad in his office in the McDonald Harrington building. That's the key. So here are the gates. Uh, 
uh, designed in 1924-1925 by Grattan Thompson, uh, named after Sir Thomas George Roddick. They not only define but symbolize the entrance to the university's main campus, and I would suggest uh, the view, the, the experience from the campus to the city. Uh, like any gate or doorway, it, it operates both, both ways as both a framing element and as a kind of a threshold. The classical colonnade, masterfully restored by Evoque Architecture a few years ago, welcomes visitors with a restored clock and chimes, as everyone in this room knows, that preserves an important and historic link between the campus and the, and the city of Montreal. I'm gonna come back to those big black things later, and I'm glad Eric is in the room. Uh, and just inside the unnamed main drag uh, leaning up to the arts building. I say main drag because it's, uh, and I, I was in a meeting uh, earlier this morning where we talked about the opportunity that the university now enjoys to start putting names on things, our pathways, our special places, where do we gather, uh, the, the lanes, uh, the plazas and the terraces, the, the corners that we all recognize, but, but really have no names for. So we agreed this morning uh, in, the, in the group with whom I was meeting that, that the naming is a great opportunity to um, uh, basically tell the community who we are, maybe what our values are, but also address issues related to truth and reconciliation and, and history. Um, uh, we'll, we'll come back to that image uh, in, a, in a minute. And the red line, of course, is going to be a, a key element in the first part of the, of the talk. I, I wanna do a quick aside here. As you may know, uh, McTavish Street, which you see here, was effectively handed over to McGill by the Ville de Montréal in 2010. In 2017, as part of the celebrations of the 375th anniversary of its founding, the city redesigned the street as part of the new river to mountain, the Promenade Urbaine, using the material palette developed by McGill's internal design office for both McTavish and the area contained by the Roddick Gates. And I'm, I'm happy to see in the room here, Brian Karasik and Erica Goldstein, who both played key roles in that entire process. So let's get back to the art building. So the elegant, uh, this, this photograph was taken soon after the building was completed in 1843. So the elegant and more or less symmetrical classical composition of the arts building as we know it, so familiar as an icon of the university, is actually the result of over 80 years of construction, renovation, and addition. The central pavilion, the original arts building, and the east pavilion, Dawson Hall, which is what you see in this photograph, from the McCord Museum collection were completed in 1843 and they were designed by a London born architect and land surveyor named John Ostell, who made his way to Canada, I think in 1834, 1835 and, and set up an architectural practice almost immediately. Um, he won the commission for the arts building in a design competition. The inset shows some of Ostell's, one of Ostell's first major works, which is the customs house in the Vieux Moyal not far from the Pointe de Carrière Archaeological Museum by uh, Dan Hangeny. Uh, let's go on to the next image. Uh, this, this is later. This photograph, uh, also from McCord, was taken around 1925, 1926, soon after 1925. Uh, the West Pavilion, Molson Hall, and the one-story links between the three blocks were completed in the early 1860s, I think 1862. Peter McNally will correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and the second floor of the links, the, uh, the, the, the original links were only one story. The second floor of the links um, uh, was added in 1925, um, sorry, in the 1880s, but it was not until 1925 that architects Featherston and McDougall replaced the wooden porch. The university couldn't afford to build the stone portico. 1925, the wooden porch was replaced with the limestone door portico that we know and completed the renovations to the main lobby that developed the Grand Hall that we all recognize today. That's an interior of the arts building that you see there. Here's a plan of the um, campus and the area between us and what is now Place Ville Marie uh, from the archives of celebrated urbanist Vincent Ponte, whose material we were able to collect with assistance from the Alumni Association about 10 or 15 years ago. The plan shows parcels of land below Sherbrooke Street. What you see in the blue box shows the parcel then owned by McGill University, referred to in the drawing as the McGill subdivision, 26 acres defined by Mansfield Street on the west 
University Street on the east, Sherbrooke on the north, and Dorchester, now Hanelovec, on the south. Although, although most of the property actually stops just below Cathcart. That's a big piece of land. Uh, what's interesting about this subdivision plan on the previous slide is that it was very likely based on this survey prepared actually by John Ostell, or at least supervised by him in his capacity as a land surveyor. Uh, when McGill opened for classes in 1843, the only uh, assets, uh, owned by the institution were the land and the two pieces of the arts building that had just been built. There was no money for salaries or books, blackboards, or even chalk, like according to the, the legends that, 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 we, that, we, uh, that we're told. The solution, simple, uh, design a subdivision and sell the 26 acres deemed unnecessary at that time, plot by plot. Ostel was commissioned to draw it up. And what's interesting about Austell's plan, here's a detail from the red box in the previous plan. You see Sherbrooke Street. The, the red line, of course, is on more or less the axis to the Roddick Gates. And what's interesting about Austell's survey plan, the design of the actual subdivision, is the slight difference in the dimension of the lots on either side of McGill College. Why on earth would a surveyor and, and the subdivision designer tweak the numbers to be uneven? Well, the answer is simple. Um, uh, and Vincent Ponte uh, made this suggestion in, a, in an unpublished manuscript that was part of the materials we acquired. He suggested that the numbers were probably tweaked by Austell or at his request to align the center of the new McGill College Avenue, part of the arts building with the dome of the new arts building. One advantage of, of being the architect of the building and the designer of the subdivision is you get to do things like that. Um, I'm, I'm gonna read now from one of Ponte's articles. Uh, he says, Austell's subtle, subtle manipulation of the subdivision plan to enhance his building also benefited the city. And this is really why I'm talking about this in this context. By happy coincidence, a perfect alignment with respect to the arts building also meant perfect alignment with respect to the profile of Mount Royal. In this way, in 1845, Montreal acquired a longitudinal open space, uh, what, what I refer to as the urban room the street that created the vista, which has figured so dramatically in the city's recent history. However, and this is me talking, the lots didn't sell. And the fact was the subdivision was very far from municipal services. And the only source of water for the lots in that 26 acre parcel were wells. Um, Ponte again, but that would soon change. It had been apparent for some years that the city's major reservoir located in what is now uh, Carré Saint Louis was no longer adequate. Another source of water was needed. And the spot chosen for the new reservoir was directly behind and uphill uh, from the Miguel campus. In 1852, uh, after two successive fires had caused widespread damage in the lower town, construction of the municipal aqueduct, as it was then called, was taken energetically in hand. And the uh, we, we move on here um, for a direct and convenient route for the, its water mains, the city decided on McGill College Avenue as shown on the subdivision plan. And accordingly on February 16th, 1856, the city of Montreal and the Royal Institution of the Advancement for Learning, which still governed McGill College, reached an agreement whereby the avenue to its entire width of 60 feet at that time, and over the distance between St. Catherine and Sherbrooke streets would be conveyed to the city for the purpose of laying the water pipes of the city of Montreal in that part of the city, and that the city would then convert the avenue into a public street, well macadamized, um, well fenced, well drained, like the other macadamized streets of the city, with proper footpaths on both sides, and moreover to be used as a public street forever by the name of McGill College Avenue. After 1856, McGill College Avenue was itself was no longer just a pair of lines on a subdivision map. It was a physical reality on the ground. It was paved. It was an official city street. And you're seeing here a couple of images uh, from the McCord collection again, uh, a streetscape in, in winter and, and a, a synagogue, which uh, occupied a, a very privileged position on the Girl College for, for many years. Uh, this delightful condition, the alignment of the center of McGill College Avenue with the Dome of the Arts Building lasted until the late 1970s. Um, early 80s, when the street was widened to accommodate 
the office towers that, that, uh, that now line both sides of the avenue. Some of you may be aware of the history of homologation of the boundaries of McGill College uh, in, that, in that period, consistent with the, with the city's plan to turn it into the boulevard uh, that, that, that we now enjoy. Um, the original center line of uh, Stell's Avenue now lies actually on the east sidewalk, and it's actually now marked uh, with, a, with a, a granite block cut from the same quarry as the two giant uh, black granite pucks on either side of the other side of the Roddick gates. Uh, those pucks were, were developed by the design office. Uh, Erica, I think you were involved in that. Uh, Emmanuel Lapointe, I think, was the lead designer and coordinator of the project. Brian, you were also a, a key player in that exercise. And the decision was made very early on to treat each of those pucks as a kind of a resting place, um, but to also use them uh, to uh, like a kind of a, a ground level belvedere. And the idea was to develop a series of pointers to significant sites. Um, uh, for example, the campus, McDonald campus. It says here 31 kilometers away. That may be as the crow flies. I know when I drive there, it's a, it's a little bit longer, maybe 38 or 40, but, that, but that's okay. Uh, and other pointers, of course, point to True North. And some of you may know that True North isn't actually lined with McGill College, just about 60 degrees to the right. So, so we think of City North and, and True North. Uh, other pointers or other sites referenced uh, on these granite pucks are the St. Lawrence River, uh, uh, Mont Saint-Hilaire, and of course, the McDonald campus. A quick aside, quick detour to the McDonald campus. I'm not gonna say much about the McDonald campus, but I did wanna show you one very interesting document. So you see here a map from Google Earth. Uh, there, there's your 31 kilometers as the crow flies more or less from Montreal to the McDonald campus, which you, which you see in the red circle. If you're getting a sense that there's a lot more land there than, than in the city, uh, you'd, you'd be right. Uh, and here uh, from the 2005, uh, this slide and the next two are actually from the 2005 master plan prepared by a team coordinated by Diamond Schmidt Architects, working with a, an internal university committee chaired by engineering dean, uh, John Grzleski. Um, the red line that you can vaguely see divines uh, all of the university's extensive holdings at this western tip of the island, including the Arboretum, which is the area colored in green, and the buildings below Highway 40 in the yellow box. So let's go down to the yellow box. So there's a detail from the same master plan uh, document that simply highlights the actual structures in the area between Highway 40 and the St. Lawrence River or Lac St. Louis. And here's the interesting drawing, uh, uh, also from that master plan. Here's the dramatic comparison of the two campuses drawn to the same scale and simply superimposed. So, you know, we have a, a sense when we wander around this campus that it is massive and it, it is indeed uh, tip to tip, so something like 80 acres, as I mentioned previously, but compared to the holdings at McDonald. It's, it's, it's basically lost. It's, it's a lot denser. Uh, it has, enjoys a different history. There are some wonderful overlaps, uh, but that's, a, that's another story. I'm gonna now, uh, we, we want to now talk a little bit more about the urban room. I'm okay for time so far? Yeah, yeah. Um, back to the city and a series of aerial views showing the state of those 26 acres sold in the, sold in the 1850s over a period of 70 years. Here's, here's 2022. I, I downloaded this from, from Google Earth yesterday. So it's, it's, it, I think it's fairly accurate. And of course you're seeing the axis from the dome, not down the center of McGill College Avenue, not the axis of the boulevard, but actually running down the one sidewalk, which we can't use now because of the construction associated with the REM station. There's a lot going on. Uh, let's, let's go back 50 years, 1971. And we're seeing uh, the de development around the campus is a, a little sparser. But, but the remarkable um, differences are, are surely in that block between Sherbrooke Street and St. Catherine, which you'll see in more detail in a minute. Here's 1962, uh, and we're seeing here in, in 62, uh, a little bit more development. 1953, look at, look, at the, look at the difference between what we have now and what we see there. You see Strathcona Hall here. You see the Max Welton at the bottom of your image where I lived for three years. It was a wonderful place to live. You see the Eaton store over there. And a couple of uh, 
some summers ago, 2015, I uh, uh, asked a research assistant working on Pompey's archives with me to uh, prepare a computer model of the current state in McGill College and to lay it on top of that photograph. So you're getting here a sense of the, of the difference, the transformation of that street. And here we take the computer model and we're running it all the way to Placeville Marie. Let's take another look at Placeville Marie. Uh, this photograph I took yesterday, I went for a walk at lunch. The, the REM station construction hoarding you see on the left, but something's changed down at the bottom. There's a, there's a giant ring there. A, a, a kind of PVM version of the rotic gates. It, 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 I, that's not exactly how it was conceived, but I like to think of it this way. McGill has the rotic gates as a kind of filter. And, and at the other end of this magnificent urban room, you've got this, this uh, what I think is an amazing installation by landscape architect and designer Claude Cormier, whom some of you may know and whose work some of you may know. Uh, interesting to compare also the, the recent uh, rehabilitation of the access from the Place de Marie Plaza to McGill College Avenue, that, that awful garage entrance, which for decades, more than 50 years, basically marked the end of McGill College, has been transformed with a combination ramp and staircase that recalls project by Montrealer Ray Affleck and Arthur Erickson in Robson Square in Vancouver. I was cynical about this installation, I, I confess, until I looked at it from the Place Marie Plaza a few weeks ago for the very first time. And, and what, I, what I found there was, was this ring, which I no longer see at, seeing attached to the original buildings associated with PVM. It, it, it floats in that space and, and it focuses attention on the campus and the flank of Mount Royal in, in a way in a way that the profiles of the buildings never could. It's like holding a, it's like holding a, a kind of a viewfinder up to your eye. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's unexpected, it's effective, and I, I would say surprisingly powerful. I'm gonna go now uh, to fire as a, as a generator, as a, a catalyst for change in the evolution of our, of our campus. This, I use this image also as a reminder uh, that we do, that ours is essentially a winter campus. We, we enjoy the summers, but the, our students' experience is, is, it's not actually confined. It's mostly about, mostly about the winter. Uh, that's, that's an old car of mine. Uh, we haven't been allowed to park on campus since 2010, which is a good thing. And I was part of that committee and so were Brian and Erica that made that recommendation. Uh, most of my observations of the campus are, are from that window. Uh, which is where my office has been since 1987. I, I could bore you silly with hundreds, if not thousands of photographs of the, of the campus at every conceivable time of the year, every conceivable activity. But it's nice to compare this to what it was like 100 years ago. Uh, and, and you might look at it first and say, that's 120 years ago, uh, uh, more or less. Uh, all three of these buildings were designed by Andrew Taylor, McDonald Engineering, in, 19, in 1893, McDonald Harrington in 1896, and McDonald Physics currently under restoration in uh, 1898. All three of these buildings have been uh, lovingly and meticulously restored by the university in the last 10 years. But that building on the left is not the building that we know today. It, 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 it's similar in mass and in footprint, but that building, um, uh, this building here, That's the original building, 1893, Andrew Taylor, was actually destroyed by fire in April of, of 1907. Here's a, a page of a calendar published by a, either a student group or the university in 1908. And of course, uh, two of the months are, are marked with news of two fires. One was the McDonald Engineering Building, which was destroyed on April 5, 1907 originally erected by Sir William MacDonald. That's another, that William MacDonald should be the subject of another lecture. Um, and the medical building, and you'll see that in a minute, destroyed by fire 11 days uh, after the fire in, what's that? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay, I'm gonna go fast. Okay. Um, 11 days later, uh, the engineering building was rebuilt by Percy Nobbs. Uh, uh, past director of the 
School of Architecture at McGill, former president of the Province of Quebec Association of Architects, now the Order of Architects. He was interested in iconography uh, and uh, he's, he marks the opportunity to intervene in this way with the bar relief of, a, of the phoenix rising from the ashes, uh, now almost completely concealed by planting. There's the medical building uh, built in 1872 that was destroyed 11 days after the engineering building. It was replaced by this building for biology by Ross and McDonald architects in uh, 1922. In 1965, biology moved up to its new premises on the medical, in the medical precinct and one floor was added and the building was turned over to the administration. But the stone frog that always guarded the entrance when it was a biology building is still there guarding the entrance. And in yellow above, you see the principal's office. The last project I'm gonna go through very quickly. It's about steam. <laughs> I'll, I'll need maybe three or maybe another five minutes. Um, you will recognize uh, this area of the campus, but you may not know that underground is the, uh, is the tunnel that moves steam for building heating from one part of the campus to the other. In fact, in fact there are steam tunnels in a number of areas on the campus. Uh, and, and people uh, on occasion. Uh, about 15 years ago, the need to replace the steam tunnel under this area became acute and a new development project was put in place. Uh, that's what it looks like in better times. Uh, the landscape was designed by a celebrated uh, a former professor in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning, Harold Spence Sales. And, and we have always, uh, as a community, not just in the School of Architecture and Planning, but we have always a treasure, the genius uh, in the organization of that sequence of stairs and landings. Uh, it's a diagonal pathway. So we're gonna invite David up to take any questions. <laughs> so the first question for David was repeat everything about STEAM and also multiple requests from Zoom to just keep going. You said you were mindful of time, but everyone wants you to just keep talking. Um, so we had some people leave, but if you're willing, everybody wants to hear more. Um, some people did have to leave. My question, and I think there's a couple others in this group as well. Let's see. Somewhere about food sciences and nutrition. And my question was actually about that synagogue that you showed on McGill College. And I wondered what at what point that, dis uh, that disappeared from the landscape of the avenue there. It's a great question, Jacqueline. I don't know the answer to that. I, I have the plan that shows where it was, but it's something that we never looked into. One of the Zoomers actually put in a link to the building itself and the record. So I can jump down the rabbit hole on that one. Yeah. Um, you have some hellos from the Zoom chat as well. So say hi, hi from the Laurentians, from Wayne Wood and Barbara Lewis. Wayne Wood and Barbara Lewis, great to see them. Yeah. I, also see, I, see, I saw Rod Studd on the call before, whom I haven't seen since 1974. <laughs> uh, former student and colleague, Ricardo de Filippo, uh, near Lausanne in Switzerland. Um, great to see everybody. And, and some, some Vikram Bat here in the room. Mm -hmm. Alwyn, former student and now a famous lawyer. So, any, other, uh, any, any questions? Hey, any? From the chat, I think we don't have any burning questions about, we all got a little bit derailed at the end there as we left. <laughs> There's David also a hello David, from Switzerland. just jumped in. He went to Google for the synagogue 1920 for the demolition date, I think, which sounds about right. Yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. And there's also a hello from Switzerland there from Ricardo. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you want me to ask my question? Sure. Do you want me to ask my question? Again? Yeah, we had an interesting question from Peter McNally. Go ahead, Peter. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Well, the two squares, the one beside uh, the, uh, the James Administration Building, which opened about 10 years ago, and the new square beside on McTavish Street, beside the Leacock Building, uh, what's the link between them? They look to me to be somewhat similar in, uh, in design. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, Jacqueline, do you need to have David repeat the question. We could hear it, actually. That's fine. <laughs> Okay. I, mean, I suspect it. Okay, very good. Peter has that magic voice, which I don't. <laughs> um, it's a great question, Peter. The uh, what what links them, I think, are a number of a number of ideas. 
Uh, one is that it's a university um, and that the opportunity to create an outdoor space for teaching was seized in the or exercised by William Zesman at Ecoe with the full support and encouragement of the university. Um, uh, and, the, and the more recent exercise by Leacock um, is also developed as a kind of amphitheater. Uh, in other words, it's, it's, a, it's a landscape uh, that, that rises from a central point, which could be, which could be for a, a musical, could be for a, four, could be for a string quartet, could be for a single speaker, it could be for a teacher, it could be for a panel discussion. But the idea that you could shape the landscape to focus observers on a stage, I think, is what links them both. They're also linked in relation to the material palettes associated with both. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the, the space uh, uh, created by the administration building, engineering, uh, and the west end, uh, the east end of the arts building, uh, and the Milton Gates is more formal with respect to the organization of the outdoor seating. And the opportunity was seized by Jeremy and his team in the space beside Leacock to develop a much more, um, a much more, um, well, a much less formal space. There's more green grass, you know, between the, between the hard seats, more opportunity to move around informally. Yes, a follow up. It just strikes me that it's very creative use of small spaces, mm -hmm. which frankly had, um, were just there. No one yeah. paid any attention to them. And now it's been very creative and uh, it's made these spaces very interesting and people places. People seem to be attracted to them in a way that was never there before. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit like you know the transformation of the library over the last 10 or 15 years. And I, I remember one librarian, I forget which one it was. Uh, it might have been Janine Schlipp uh, when she was here, uh, uh, maybe her successor saying, we want the library to be a place, it might have been the principal. Uh, but, but they said they, they saw the library um, as a place where people would want to go just to hang out. Uh, and the idea that the campus, without sacrificing you know, you know, privacy or authority, could uh, could provide that kind of amenity. It's a very exciting idea. Well, what she used to was Janine. So what Janine used to say. Uh, is that uh, Stephen? Yeah. Stephen, yeah. Stephen, nice to see you. So she wanted the library to be a place where people wanted to be because they wanted to be there, mm -hmm. not because they have to be there. Yeah. So yeah. It, I don't know if uh, people heard that, but. We uh, got it. It's a place that you want to be because you want okay. to be there, not because you have to. There's, there's a question in there's, the chat. Yes, there is, which is a funny one. Um, this comes in from Wes Cross, in your yeah, opinion. Yeah. yeah, I knew Wes would come up with something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who was the greatest McGill campus architect not named Percy? Um, well, that's like asking a parent uh, who their favorite child was. Um, the, um, not that I would know anything about that, but, but I read a lot. The... Um, McGill has uh, McGill has worked worked with some truly astounding architects over the years. I think it's fair to say, Peter. I think you would agree with me, Brian. Um, you know, and you know, starting with John Ostell, you know, in eighteen thirty nine when he was when he won the competition to design the arts building, uh, but it, but including uh, Andrew Taylor in in the various incarnations of his architectural practice. And Percy Nobbs, who was a remarkable man in so many, in so many ways, published a, a book about uh, salmon fishing. Um, uh, was a member of the Canadian Olympic fencing team in the early part of the 20th century. I don't think he medaled, but I'm pretty sure he competed. Um, and more recently, you know, architects um, like the um, like Ray Affleck and his team, who are responsible for the student center from the Leacock building for the transformation of the McDonald Harrington building for the School of Architecture in 1985. Um, uh, Ray Affleck as a young architect, as, a, as an intern, was also largely responsible for the uh, Frank Dawson Adams building, which, which is a much better building than most people think as they rush through, you know, from the campus to University Street. So uh, we, we, it's a great question, Wes, but it should be the subject of another 
another another presentation. It would be fun actually to go through just the names. And not only, this is something Nancy Dunton and I did a few years ago, but with respect to McGill, we looked at the architects of McGill and the question was, well, what else were they doing when, while they were working for McGill? But that was a longer presentation. So a great question. Yeah, Brian. Interesting but question about Gene Square and the name, because I know when it was developed, that was kind of the, the name that was used for, for, for sort of lack of a better name, but it stuck. And I've seen more and more people refer to it as Jane Square, even though it's mm -hmm. Visitor's Garden, mm -hmm. you know, it's not commemorating that. But it's interesting to know how that evolved and it, what the official name actually is. Mm -hmm. And should we be attributing a name to the square that we built next to the uh, Peacock Building? Interesting thing to figure out what we should do. Mm -hmm. yeah, do you have a suggestion for the name of the um, of the new square? No, the I new don't want to touch that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it, I think it's a great it's a great suggestion. The visitor's garden. Those of you who don't know that the the visitor is the governor general of Canada. Yes. That's the official title. He's, he is he is the visitor to the university, and the, and it was inaugurated by David Johnson, I think, if I'm not mistaken, when he was governor general. I don't know if that name is should be changed, but there's so many other opportunities around the campus. I don't know of a single other part of the campus that's, that, that actually is named either as a pathway or a place or a, a, a plaza. The so from... history of McGill has a lot of streets, as you said, that are not named, that mm -hmm. would maybe benefit from it. Mm -hmm. it called Main Road or Biology Road. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Graduates Road. Yeah. Graduates Road. I think it's something, something, something to be the Three Bears is another one. Three Bears. Yeah. yeah. Some sculpture. Yeah. Some... yeah. But we really do have an opportunity. Y intersection. <laughs> we agreed this morning in the other meeting that the Y intersection is, is off the table yeah. as, as a name. But, but they, they really are, when you think about it, the opportunity to use the names uh, to, um, to document our history and, and the relationship we would like to enjoy. You know, with with our, our own internal community and the outside community, it's it's irresistible. It should be irresistible, but but it's going to call for. Um, it's um, when you say you don't want to be part of that process. It, it's going to be a, it's going to, it'll be an interesting process to track. The autonomy, of course, was uh, yes. The process for autonomy and naming has changed significantly, um, and we were all involved there from it as well. And it was yes. Back in the day, different world now, though. Stanley Frost, Derek Drummond, Frost was and who was the third member of that top of the group? Uh, um, Richard Cruz. Richard oh. Cruz. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it sounds like uh, we have the makings of another talk and another speaker, and perhaps a whole series by you, David. So, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, people at home, for staying. You um, definitely were enthusiastic because very few of you left, both in the room here and on Zoom, so I think that means a hit. So that extra 15 minutes was worth it and we apologize about the, the glitch. But anyway, we have a number of events coming up. I think you'll find it in equally interesting if you go to the Roar website and look at upcoming events or library upcoming events. You'll be, um, I think, pleased at what you see. Please do join our mailing list as well so that um, you can find out about events as they come and follow us on all our social media. Anyway, thank you all very much. Have a good evening, afternoon, bye.